Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DoD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DoD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSI. Before we get started today, I would like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you're doubted my phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSI webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to view webinar PDF, click here. Uh, second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat button on the left hand side of the webinar screen. You can chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, please use the audience questions tool at the top center of your screen. Uh, that is the icon that looks like a chat bubble next to the file folder. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q&A. For the benefit of those on the phone, I'll read the question out loud to the presenter. Uh, if you have any technical issues during the presentation, have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Check back to the CSI website. Once the webinar is posted, the GoToWebinar button will take you to the YouTube link. And with that said, uh, I will now hand it off to today's presenters. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Philip. Uh, yeah, today uh, we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, a simulation-based testing approach for DoD software uh, tied into CI/CD pipelines and uh, using an, ar an architecture that's aligned to NATO. Uh, so let's get right into it. Kind of given a little uh, intro to this, uh, you know, we've basically got uh, you know the, the software and systems lifecycle. Right, and the software lifecycle is very much focused on development and you know incorporation of DevSecOps principles. And the systems lifecycle covers you know the full breadth of the product uh, from conception to acceptance testing. And this really was about trying to tie those two together, focus initially on the modeling and simulation piece, uh, looking at you know software that's more oriented at at military applications, which the uh, the synthetic data to test that can be you know, very complex and, and uh, very diverse. So we're going to get into some, some aspects of, of what we looked at around this um, using mostly GOTS tools, but some COTS tools as well. And uh, we'll focus on the synthetic test generation, as I mentioned, tying it into the CICD pipeline, but also looking at how do we make this cloud native, scalable, and, uh, and and bring automation to bear. So next, let's get into some of the background uh, of, of how this kind of came about. Uh, let's start with the, the software factory reference design. Um, and I'll just give a brief overview of this. I'm sure many of you are familiar. Uh, the DoD re released this back in March 2021. Uh, but if we think about the typical development workflow, 
sort of starting from our local environment uh, with the code repository, we have our build tools. Uh, there might be some test tools as well, scanning dependencies. As we work our way to the test environment, you know, we have a pipeline and, and these can be configured in different ways, but this is a pretty good ordering of things where we start with build, uh, usually hit our SAS type testing, we do unit level testing. We'll send those artifacts out to an artifact management, uh, verify if we build a container image, you know, make sure we don't have any criticals and highs and then uh, deploy that out to the test environment at the end here. Beyond the test environment, this is where we kind of get to the right hand of the V in the systems life cycle, where we're really starting to focus on functional testing, UI testing, um, and up to the point of realistic data, which is where modeling simulation uh, really brings a lot of value. And while the reference design didn't really focus a lot on this aspect of the data, they certainly left uh, a, a hook in there for that with this test tool category, which covers all kinds of test suites. Um, and so this is kind of where we're focused in, is trying to bring the right side of this into the left as much as possible and, and trying to make that MNS data accessible to the developers and be able to run on a continuous basis. Um, and so, of course, there's all kinds of tools in this arena. Uh, again, talking through those different types of testing, you know, you have your uh, you know, smart bear Catalan type tools. Um, this would be sort of an extension of, of that sort of thought process tying into the pipeline. There. Getting a, a bit more into the background. So again, I kind of mentioned the software systems lifecycle uh, programs that we've worked on. We've, we've sort of noted that, you know, again, that it, it kind of tends to be silos. The software development community has really pushed hard on automation and, and has done a good job on the left side, but typically they're gonna be very focused on the unit level testing. Maybe you're bringing functional testing into your pipeline, uh, but some of that stuff out to the right, it's still you know, kind of getting handed over the wall. I issues are found with real data and you know the feedback is not as continuously and, and, and uh, tight knit as the other types of testing. Uh, typically, developers won't be looking directly at the MNS data. They'll be mocking up data just for the purpose of really verifying the units and the functions that, that they need to verify, uh, but not as much thinking about the validation piece where it's you know mission relevant. So we want to bring the value of that MNS testing uh, back in. And, and as I mentioned before, and as everyone knows, uh, these applications are very complex, um, you know, diverse types of data compared to the commercial world. Um, so it doesn't tend to be a focus on that side. Um, just to give an example of, of something that could be used, uh, you know, more of a processing, exploitation, and dissemination uh, bit where we're gathering information from sensors, uh, bringing it in to consolidate for an analyst community. Um, so that kind of real data could be a test for a system that does that. And, and a lot of applications to mission software as well. And uh, one, one of the key things we're going to talk about here is an analytics service. So, you know, it's good to tie this all together, but also provide the, the metrics that we typically would um, on the right side of the, the life cycle, the systems life cycle tied to the MNS and, and bringing it into the pipeline as well. Slide here. Um, and then talking a little bit about the, let's say skip one, uh, MNS as a service layer. Um, so, so this piece, you know, we, we, we went to look for standards and we found uh, the native standard from 2019 that really gets into modeling simulation as a service. They've done a really good job of specifying a taxonomy here to break out different elements of the architecture. And we tried to adopt that as much as possible into this framework. So you can see to the right there, some of the types of services, and I don't believe this is exhaustive, um, but if you look at uh, some of the integration services, there's a lot of middleware, um, things that'll do translations back and forth, uh, things that will pull mo models together, um, interoperate between simulations, of course, handle the control side of the house. You've got all the repository and editing pieces. Um, and then you've got the actual modeling simulation services themselves. And of course, there, there's a lot out there and we're not trying to 
create anything new per se, just trying to wrap existing and, and help it interoperate and tie into the life cycle. Um, and the other, the other bit of this that's important is really the service orientation. Um, you know, different modeling simulation tools are at different levels of maturity with regards to this, and of course, on different journeys in terms of modernization. But by making it a service orientation, you know, we can make it uh, very modular, reusable, uh, able to be cloud native uh, by its, you know, its very nature there, and that will really help on the deployment side. Uh, you know, getting these kinds of tools installed into an environment and really working with each other. So that's that 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 was a heavy focus on on this initial effort uh, related to simulation based testing. And then just kind of taking a look at a closer look at the approach. Uh, there, you know, as I said, there's a slew of MNS tools out there. Uh, a lot of GOTS tools that that have you know, different use cases and different strengths and weaknesses. Um, there's also a lot of COTS tools out there. Uh, you know, we work a lot with ANSYS, for example, and, and they fill gaps as well. And so try, just trying to bring the best of breed tools together and depending on what the solution is or what the customer is, you know, bringing the right tech stack together to focus on that particular use case. Um, you know, we're really trying to bring some of the high fidelity synthetic environments into this, tying to more of the high level campaign and mission level as well uh, to, to make them mesh together um, and, and, and starting to bring some of that realism in. And, you know, as we mentioned before, we're really just trying to wrap existing services that are out there, um, orchestrate, um, you know, try to interoperate between, between what's out there currently. Um, so I've mentioned a lot of these attributes already, but, you know, starting at the top, really focus on cloud native, you know, everything that we're doing in the DOD is going that direction. Um, and this should be no exception and to really tie into the pipeline and, and to be, you know, again, ease that installation process. You know, this, this is part of it. And Kubernetes is kind of at the center of this, whether you're on-prem, AWS, Azure, uh, to kind of enable that, that portability. So. We've been um, you know, looking at this getting deployed on Kubernetes from the start. Uh, talk a little bit about that modular nature. Uh, obviously, each tool is a little different in terms of how it's currently architected. Um, so as much as we can, we try to uh, you know, put that into a deployment scheme where it is modular um, and, and try to work with you know, whether it's the government or commercial vendors you know, to you know, often uh, break that apart you know, if we can. But, um, you know, tr just trying to deal with the, the current architecture at the moment. Uh, trying to make this flexible. You know, again, we're not trying to be too prescriptive about how these things get combined together or how they run in the pipeline per se, uh, but trying to provide an architecture where um, whoever's using it can, can pull these things together easily. You know, obviously, continuous and automated go together, right? Um, trying to make this as automated as possible and MNS tends to be very man in the loop focused at the moment. Um, obviously, you still need to build up your scenario, right? So there's, there's still a lot of uh, manual aspects in that, but trying to take the uh, man in the loop out of the execution aspect of this as much as possible. Um, and cross-functional, right? So DevSecOps, the spirit of it is trying to break down silos and pull different functions together. And you know, again, that, that kind of facilitates this for the, the software and systems community, uh, pulling that all closer together. And then the interoperability piece, right? So if you take, for example, an AFSIM and an SDK, uh, you know, how do we how do we uh, integrate those so that they're talking to each other? And again, using uh, the best of the strengths and weaknesses there. So that's obviously a focus. Um, getting into the actual architecture side, so I've hit on some of this. I think uh, modeling simulation as a service we covered pretty well. Um, but yeah, just talking about that red layer, this is really where all the scenarios live, where they get built, uh, where they execute and the simulation engines. And so largely that piece is the existing tools wrapped so that they operate in, you know, and get deployed into a cloud native environment, uh, but also some of the aspects of the interoperability here. Um, Although that starts to feed into the green layer where we're really tying everything together. Um, so each MS tool would, 
would communicate via the green layer, via the service uh, SIM service adapters piece. Uh, there's also a job manager in here where the user can pretty flexibly set up how they want things automated, how they want things talking to each other, um, and would like to share some of those things across the community, of course. So not every user has to recreate um, and, and, and build some of those things. Uh, but this layer is also talking directly to your software factory over to the right here, which is where you run your um, system under test. You know, and whether that be a simple service, whether that be a full up, uh, you know, uh, application or a series of applications, this is really where the the pipeline comes into play. Um, and it should be noted whether the scenario changes or whether the software changes, the idea would, would be for the uh, the pipeline to re-execute in either case. Um, obviously, you might be asking yourself, well. You know, this doesn't seem practical because simulations can take a long time to execute. Um, and I think depending on what you're testing, you can certainly take snippets of those simulations. But the other piece of this is really we're focused on feeding that synthetic data in there. Um, and so unless the scenario changes, the, the simulation results could, of course, be cached and, and used in further uh, pipeline executions. I think if the scenario changes, uh, of course, we want to rerun, but that could be more of like a nightly or weekly uh, or, or weekend type execution. And then the other layer on the very top there, uh, the blue layer, is really focused on the metrics and reporting aspects of this. So, you know, great, we're running these simulations together, but we want to be able to get insights into what's happening, you know, help the developers fix their software, uh, maybe, you know, show the system side, okay, this is how the tests are working. Um, so, of course, we want to capture the typical metrics that surround that particular type of scenario uh, up there as well. So that's kind of the, the architecture there. And then, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the modeling simulation as a service ecosystem, but, and I mentioned the editors and repository. Uh, largely, the scenario editors are whatever your editor happens to be for your tool, right? So it might be, you know, SDK proper. It might be uh, Axum. Um, so of course, you still have to construct your scenarios. Uh, repository uh, could potentially package these different types of scenarios together. Uh, but of course, you know it'll maintain the native structure as well. And uh, you know this is an area really, really bringing the all the uh, scenarios together. And then I mentioned the simulation service as well. Um, and and we've used the uh, you know the open API and REST uh, to do that communication and that green layer that I talked about, um, and and the adapters right. So each simulation framework, whether it's you know uh, SDK and it's with its API or Appsim with with a Biz or an XIO, will be able to translate and interoperate with this open API uh, to pass information back and forth through the pipeline as needed. Um, so that's really where we focus there. And it's not that we couldn't support other uh, types of interfaces, but uh, REST is pretty pretty common, uh, you know, pretty easy to work with. So that was a natural uh, first selection. Um, and then, you know, I talked a lot about the, the automation analysis ecosystem already. Uh, but again, just kind of hit on the, the flexibility of the simulation based uh, jobs there how uh, we can set this up the adapters uh, also you know the ecosystem that we're working in will allow for some some third-party plugging for the analytics side more on that blue layer um, you know so we're going to have all kinds of different types of reports different formats um, and we can enable that with with the architecture there uh, then all of this will be collected to a database uh, to consolidate that information uh, more on the CI/CD integration front. So, and this is just uh, you know example pipeline, uh, and, and in this case with Jenkins, but um, GitLab was another orchestrator we brought in as well. Um, and the emphasis isn't so much on on the jobs that are listed here. Right, again, it's an example. Um, different pipelines are constructed slightly differently, but you'll see some common things in here like the build process, the SAS, uh, building your container image. But at the end of it, right, this is the key part, we're putting that simulation 
based testing aspect in there. Uh, and, and again, you could have multiple jobs running concurrently, potentially, right? We're just showing one here. Uh, you might want to stage things a little differently. Uh, but again, this, this one is just an example. And you'll see there it says six seconds, right? So for our particular example, we took a snippet of synthetic data uh, from, from that simulation and used it. So it was a pretty quick operation. Obviously, if you're running a pull-up scenario, like a day's worth of data for some reason for your software, again, it could take longer, but you know, sort of back to the caching piece of it, um, ways to speed up that performance. Um, and so, I could, so kind of getting into one of the examples that we ran through this. Uh, so we have a program uh, that we work called the Intelligent multi uh Autonomous Ground Re Relocatable Sensor, also known as Imagers. Um, this is a program that's really looking at mission software in, inside of a small UAS. And um, really, we were focused on the EA EOIR payload in this particular case, which is uh, doing detections using some CV algorithms. And we wanted to use um, SDK uh, to feed some synthetic data into this. Um, you know, again, to, to quickly make changes to the software as needed uh, based on some more realistic data, in this case, uh, some image-based data. Um, and so we were using this in particular to test out the extractor module using that data um, and looking more at the functional testing side, right? So this data could be used, as mentioned before, different types of testing could be performance, could be functional, could be UI. In this particular case, we, we went with functional. Um, it looks like we also took a look, a little bit of a look at performance and latency as well in this particular case. Just kind of getting to the uh, sort of uh, reference implementation for this for this example, uh, and you'll see you know a legend here highlighting the different layers. So back to that red layer of modeling simulations as a service. We've got the SDK desktop as uh, one of the tools. We've got the actual scenario uh, in its you know, sort of native format within that uh, repository type service. And then we've got the um, execution engine itself. And in this case, I believe is SDK engine uh, running the service that we need to <clears throat> inject this information. We've got the system under test. Uh, in, in this case, the imagers extractor module that we mentioned earlier. And we've got sort of the, the metrics collection on the analysis side, uh, and then a final report sort of pulling all that together. And you can see some of the flows here with the, the video data, um, the detections that are happening, and then ultimately the, uh, you know, the tracks that happen here versus the ground truth produced back here. And, um, you know, probably most important of all is the green layer where all this is getting orchestrated. Um, and we've got this job manager, right? So each of these is sort of a, a job that's that's getting executed by this orchestrator and getting tied all back together. Um, and, and this sort of proves the concept. Of course, not all of those architectural elements are used in this case. Um, that basically what we're showing here is the synthetic data being injected for, for uh, more of or the truth data here and getting some quick feedback. So anytime we make changes to this extractor, uh, this whole flow would re-execute. And anytime we go back and change the scenario, it would also re-execute this flow. And, and, and you know, something that's changed back here may very well expose a uh, you know an oversight in the logic or something along those lines in the software as well. So right, so it's not just about changing the software in this case. Um, so just a little bit more information about the simulation scenario itself and, and execution. And again, using SDK here, uh, you know, we did have some terrain data and satellite imagery uh, as part of that synthetic data set. And, uh, you know, we, we, so you can see the, the scenario executing in here as well, uh, the full 3D type animation. And, um, you know, as part of this, this data set, we're looking at the um, you know, the detections, the target data, and, and all that. Um, some, some more details on the analysis module. So here are some of the attributes uh, that we use in terms of the metrics um, and some descriptions 
for those as well. Again, don't want to focus too much on this particular example, but uh, just providing some more detail along those lines uh, about what we're showing there. Uh, again, these, these metrics can be tailored to whatever your particular use case needs to be, uh, but this was just the one that we had uh, with this image's use case. Um, and we use this, uh, this MOP metrics library uh, to facilitate some of this. Um, and again, mentioned before, you know, um, Using, using this as the ground truth to do those uh, with the comparisons back to the detection. A um, little bit more information on how that orchestration, that green layer really works and what, what job it's initiating. Uh, good old sequence diagram here, just kind of walking through each of the steps. Um, so you can kind of see deployment of the service uh, going on here, execution of the scenario. Once it's been uh, completed, we you know take that service out of the environment. And then from here, it's really getting into the actual deployment of the software itself and, and doing those detections and then pulling that back out and, and pulling all the metrics together uh, after the fact, right? So this is just an example workflow. Again, you know, depending on the use case and, and the data, this might look a little different. And then sort of uh, uh, wrapping up here, um, so, you know, going through this, using this architecture and running a thread through imagers, uh, you know, we sort of proved the, the feasibility of this concept. Um, and we really think that uh, this is going to bring a lot of value uh, within the pipeline and to, to really uh, automate the testing of software applications, right? So, I mean, down to the unit functional level, that's covered real well. Uh, we really want to bring the simulation piece further to the left of uh, with the rest of this data and make that realistic data available to developers while also providing insights back to the, the systems life cycle and the MS community as well, um, you know, as to how the, the scenario might be behaving with the software. So there might be, you know, some flaws in how the scenario is being conducted. You know, more, more often it's gonna be the software, but that's a possibility as well. And really just have those two functions talking back and forth um, to really, uh, you know, push that along and improve the quality at a much faster pace and, and also field that software at a, at a much uh, more rapid pace. Um, there's a slew of future work really to look at, um, and, and this is not an exhaustive list by any means, um, but, you know, really just looking across the architecture to not only enhance existing elements, uh, but also get into some of the ones we didn't necessarily cover in the thread we kind of prioritize based on that initial use case. Um, but as we have, have sort of gotten some interest from the community and been engaging some stakeholders of recent, you know, we'll look at, we're seeing some other use cases that have been popping up and, and sort of uh, orienting us at some different priorities. Um, obviously along the way, we want to continue to mature this, uh, focused on, you know, scale is a big one. As you introduce uh, a large number of entities, right? performance and reliability uh, on the performance side, not only the performance of the software, but uh, performance of the pipelines, you know, performance kind of applies throughout you get performance metrics um, and reliability, right? And I think uh, deploying this on Kubernetes is a big first step, but of course there's a lot of things around that uh, with high availability and uh, self-healing and everything else that uh, certainly we want to apply some more resources towards. Um, just a couple of examples, and there are many more stakeholders we've been running into, but just a couple of the programs. Uh, we've got the joint staff uh, you know, training tools. We've been, uh, we're actually doing the software factory for that now, uh, but also getting involved in JTT and some of the others, and so trying to bring that to them. Um, and then also on the DISA side with uh, GHJ as well, uh, have some discussions ongoing. Um, and of course, you know, with all these capabilities, start to lay out a roadmap, really working across uh, the DOD, um, across the stakeholders that we engage um, and, and, and trying to orient our priorities accordingly. Uh, and, one, and one part of that is really just expanding into digital engineering as a service in general. Uh, this has been very model and simulation focused. Uh, also want to bring MBSE into this and some of the other aspects, maybe uh, more physics based tools and, and things of that nature. So, um, 
So yeah, I think that concludes our presentation. Uh, certainly happy to, uh, to host any other questions. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I actually saw a similar presentation uh, last week from you guys at, at, at ITSEC uh, conference last week down in, Orla, um, down in Orlando. But um, we don't have any questions in the chat as of right now, but I had two quick high level things uh, that I would like you to touch on in the meantime, if you could. Um, one, um, our membership and our audience has kind of expressed interest in kind of like end use cases. Uh, mostly uh, some of our government folks had, had expressed interest about um, some of your work that you may have done or may have completed thus far uh, related to AFSIM or some of the force and force simulation models such as OneSAP. Um, Obviously, I know you went through this use case specifically within the presentation. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yep. Uh, so okay. we have some efforts where, we, where we've used AFSIM in the past. Um, as far as as far as the simulation based testing, I think we're pretty early on in that process. Um, we are working a little bit with uh, ANSYS on interoperability, specifically with SDK. Um, but, uh, you know, this is definitely an area of expansion. And OneSAP is another tool we've used a lot in the past. Uh, we're also uh, using NGTS on the JSE effort and looking to pull that in here as well. Uh, as it relates to AFSIM, uh, in terms of the cloud native piece, uh, it seems to be pretty easy to containerize and, and uh, stage in that deployment and also the ANSYS tools as well. Uh, but not every tool is is uh you know as as easy so certainly some work to continue to to wrap that and, and get that uh, deployed in, in those environments yeah just um, pop in on that alex too we did have yeah. some success already with afsim and and adding it to this spt architecture right it was one of our one of our wrap simulation services so uh, that has been uh, promising so far yeah. Thank you. Also, uh, one other question I had was, you kind of touched on it on the last slide, um, the process of kind of moving to uh, SBT and moving to m as a service. Um, I know some of the uh, maybe apprehension of one of the key questions we, we normally see with that, people are worried about performance. Can you speak a little bit um, about performance? I think I mentioned before, specifically with the pipeline, you know, some of our thoughts around that. Um, I think on the scalability side, as it, as it applies to performance, certainly we haven't, you know, really load tested this yet, right? It's a very uh, early proof of concept. Um, but uh, that is definitely something we're seeing from stakeholders as a focus um, and, and something we're going to be uh, prioritizing in the roadmap. Do you have any uh, specific questions around performance? Um, no, not not specifically. We did get an audience question that that just came in, so I would like to uh, jump into that. Um, so we have a question from Alex. He says, "What physics-based simulation tools and/or physical phenomena are you most urgently interested in including?" So I think as uh, part of some of the ANSYS stack, in particular, the antenna modeling tool called HFSS is a, is a tool we're using on, a, on some existing programs and one that we would like to roll in here um, that actually has some integration into SDK itself. Uh, so that's one we're particularly interested in. And in general, uh, the ANSYS stack has a lot to offer uh, across the board there. Um, now, more on the GOT side of the house, of course, there are some antenna tools out there as well, such as Echo, that could possibly be pulled in here. Um, but, uh, you know, that's not an area where we're diving real deep in just yet. We're trying to get more of the, I'll say, engineering level to mission and campaign level sort of sorted out. But uh, definitely something, something to look at. Thank you. Uh, monitoring the chat. Um, I don't believe we have anything else as of right now, um, but just really quickly, just to uh, further answer your question. So um, 
In regards to performance, um, in a previous life, I supported AMSA, which is now known as the Data Analysis Center uh, on the Army side, um, in modeling some of their uh, force on force simulations. They were kind of look very interested in looking at PNT effects and things like that. So uh, the latency um, issue um, is something of of interest to them for, uh, regarding performance. I can see them being very, very interested in that, but not to derail the conversation at all, but just to kind of uh, give you a full answer to your question prior. Yep, absolutely. And and to, you know, obviously we're limited in terms of the performance of the tools themselves. I think as we bring these tools together, uh, we can certainly highlight some of those things. Uh, but, but, but on the other side of it, on that scalability piece of a lot of entities flowing through, uh, you know, the REST API, for example, may not be the best uh, protocol. Um, so certainly we're, we're looking to entertain other protocols that can handle more of like the streaming type cases and can handle, you know, a large number of entities versus a large bandwidth for a single en entity. Um, I think the, the open API was just sort of a first step based on the current use cases we have. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, and with that said, I don't see anything else. Uh, if there are no further alibis, we will we will end today's uh, webinar presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank Alex and Jeremy uh, for the presentation today and being flexible with us. I know we had some uh, some scheduling that we had to kind of change at the last minute as well. Um, but this this was great. Um, as before, please check back to the CSI website for the recording of this presentation. The slides are also up there as well. Um, and with that said, I'd like to wish everyone happy holidays. Hopefully we see you on our next webinar in January. Thank you. Yeah, happy holidays to you as well. And thank you for uh, allowing us to do this presentation.